uh, Henry continues yesterday's lecture and uh, well, there you go. Please start. Thanks. So it was, um, the progress was a little slower yesterday than I was hoping. So we've got a slight change of format today and I hope that uh, uh, that that makes things a little uh, go a little smoother uh, today. So I'm just going to very briefly uh, recap the the main points uh, that that you should have taken away from from yesterday's talk. Uh, so that was mostly talking about um, just the geometry of quantum field theory and a static background. So the the first key point was that um, near event horizons we had this phenomenon that outgoing geodesics diverge exponentially. So one way to to express that is in terms of this relationship between an outgoing coordinate that labels outgoing null geodesics near the horizon. So this capital U coordinate is a Kruskal type coordinate that's smooth at the horizon. And, um, and this other small u, uh, which is an outgoing coordinate, which is what, uh, what's measured at, at some uh, clock at infinity. So a distant observer, uh, u labels the, uh, the time at which a distant observer sees uh, sees an outgoing geodesic and we've got this exponential relation with the surface gravity kappa here between the two um, and one of the uh, results that was essentially due to this was again studying quantum field theory on a fixed background back hole background is that if you have any state uh, at all that's um, that's non-singular at the horizon then inevitably the asymptotic observer is going to see some flux of radiation with a temperature set by the um, by the, the surface gravity. So this was the main point of yesterday, um, but this was all using a fixed background. So today we're going to to introduce some dynamics and actually have a uh, have a dynamical metric. Okay, and um, the model we're going to to be using throughout these lectures uh, is one that's the sort of simplest possible. Uh, a two-dimensional model of gravity, just to illustrate the ideas in a very concrete and simple setting. Um, so the first thing you might do in two dimensions is just try to write down the einstein hilbert action, where the action is the integral of the uh, Rigi scalar. Um, but there's a problem in two dimensions, which is that this is uh, completely uh, topological. So this, uh, so this doesn't actually give you any dynamics. Variations in the metric uh, exactly vanish for this action. So this is um, uh, another way to say it is that this um, is that the Einstein tensor uh, in two dimensions uh, is is identically zero. So this is this is an identity in two dimensions. Um, so we've got to do something something more and we can uh, uh, the simplest thing to do is to add uh, a new field. So phi is what we'll call the dilaton field. And I'm going to write down this action. For now, it might look a little arbitrary, but we'll give us some motivation for it. So it means that we've got this dilaton field. Um, but in fact, these, uh, this is not really arbitrary at all. It's very well motivated. And um, one way to see that is it's, so this comes from um, dimensional reduction. So for example, if you have something like a, a 4D, um, rise in the Nordstrom black hole. And you take uh, the temperature to be very, very small. So you're looking at low temperature limit of a black hole. So in other words, it means it's near extremal. Um, and this works for some other classes of black holes. But it's a very generic phenomenon uh, that you end up actually with, with JT gravity is what uh, describes the um, uh, the dynamics in this in this particular limit. Uh, so the way to interpret this from a higher dimensional model is that in higher dimensions we have some transverse uh, d minus two sphere. So in this instance there's the the two sphere of spherical coordinates and um, and the area of this transverse sphere is encoded in the dilaton. So in particular the extremal black hole has an area s uh, zero in Planck units and uh, the and then the uh, phi, sorry, there shouldn't be a subscript here. Uh, uh, this dilaton phi tells us about the deviations of that area from extremality. So it tells us how the how the size of the sphere is fluctuating uh, with um, uh, over our two-dimensional manifold. 
So yeah, we can. So if you want to think about a higher dimensional model, this is actually that you there is you can make magnetically charged black holes in the standard model, and there's a regime of parameters where actually JT gravity coupled to uh, coupled to the light matter is actually a very good approximation. So this is a uh, simplification, but it's uh, but it's well motivated. We'll see another uh, sort of reason why this uh, occurs is uh, due to a particular pattern of symmetry breaking later. Okay, so I've told you what the model looks like. I've given you the action. Um, just want to check. Um, the first comment I should actually make about this is uh, is that you can see already why this is very simple. Uh, because this dilaton appears linearly only, and it uh, doesn't have any kinetic terms, which means it's, you can think of this as an auxiliary field. This is like a Lagrange multiplier. And what it enforces is that whatever it multiplies has to vanish. So you get this constraint that R plus two is equal to zero. So that means that, um, that we're, we'll always be focusing on constant curvature geometries. And because we've, we've chosen the cosmological constant here, so I've absorbed the, the curvature scale into this factor of two here, um, into, into this, um, I've, I've chosen units to, to make this uh, two. Um, and we had negative curvature, so really this is looking at, um, uh, it's describing the dynamics of, of two-dimensional anti-crystal space. Um, good, I, I've told you what the model is then. Uh, I should also tell you what the boundary conditions are. Uh, First of all, we're going to look at uh, we're going to impose boundary conditions on a surface of fixed uh, dilaton, um, but we're going to always take uh, that that surface to be uh, far away, which means this dilaton is going to be very large. So we're going to fix this parameter to gamma, and uh, we're going to be you sort of taking this formal limit that epsilon goes to zero. Uh, so on this surface of fixed um, dilaton phi, this is a one-dimensional. Um, submanifold. So this is going to be uh, sort of our, our boundary of space, which, which lives near the asymptotic boundary of ADS. Uh, this has an intrinsic metric that is going to also scale with this parameter epsilon. And the important thing is that we're going to define the, uh, the time here. This time t is going to be uh, defining the physical asymptotic time. So this is sort of the time we would use to couple this to some other system, for example. Uh, so these are the usual boundary conditions actually you'd use in, in ADS CFT, for example. Uh, uh, this, is, um, this is familiar from that context. But we're going to try to avoid using ADS CFT as much as possible. Okay, so that's the model. Um, let's start studying uh, black holes in that model. So as before, I'm going to use this ingoing metric. So this is a completely general metric now. Uh, before we studied this mostly as a static metric, so there wasn't any V dependence. But this is just, uh, you can write any metric in this form. Uh, so this is a particular gauge choice, if you like. And if you compute the Ricci scalar for this metric, it's just given by the, the second R derivative of this, uh, this function f. So because we're always going to be focusing on, uh, on these, this R equals minus two metrics, we can write down the, the most general metric we have to consider by, uh, we can write it down like this. So you might like a linear term in R, but you can always get rid of that by, um, by a constant, re uh, constant redefinition of the R coordinate while keeping the metric in the same form. So, we, so this is really the most general metric we, we ever have to consider. So that's um, lovely and simple. We just take, um, so in, uh, this is sometimes called a Vidya metric, which is it's what you take by writing an ordinary black hole metric in, uh, in in ingoing coordinates, and then you promote the mass to, to depend on this ingoing time. And this is um, usually a, often a, a nice model, but it turns out that in JT gravity, these are really the only class of metrics we ever have to consider. So in these coordinates, the boundary is going to be at some large value of this radius R, and we're going to define our ingoing coordinate as always to be aligned with some asymptotic not notion of time. So it means that on this boundary, uh, our ingoing time is going to correspond to the, the physical time of the system. Okay, uh, so for these solutions, uh, we can look at the on-shell action and going back to our expression for the JT action, 
because we're on shell here, it means that this whole uh, bulk term goes away. So M here is the two dimensional manifold. And this um, boundary of M is where we are imposing boundary conditions. Uh, and this is the only term we have left. Uh, so just to let you know the notation here, uh, K here is the extrinsic curvature of the boundary. And I've added this, so this one here is really a counter term because I fixed the um, zilliton at the boundary. This is just a counter term that I can, I can choose to add. And this is convenient so that you get a finite answer in this limit. Um, so if you choose a, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so any, any boundary near the, ed, near the edge of ADS has curvature one in ADS limits, plus some small corrections. Okay. So you can go and um, calculate this extrinsic curvature. It's a simple calculation. You can plug it into Mathematica and you find that it's essentially given by this square of the, the, this RH, which is we're interpreting as the, the horizon uh, radius. So, uh, and this factor of gamma here comes from, comes from our boundary condition uh, for the dilaton. So it's this gamma here is really only setting a, a scale, uh, setting units in which we're measuring temperature and time and so forth. Okay, so we end up with just this um, boundary on shell action, which is extremely simple. Um, so now this model looks very, very simple. Um, the slight challenge is that, um, uh, is that you have to, be more careful if you want to do the path integral of how you actually do the gauge fixing in these coordinates and uh, and impose the constraints and so forth. So it means that the, this is slightly illusory. The theory looks slightly more complicated, and we'll see uh, and we'll see that in a moment. Uh, so we can already uh, now compute the energy of our of our system, our black hole, uh, and this action, you can immediately read off what the, the energy is. So now RH is a dynamical variable, it's going to vary with time, but we have this expression for the energy. Uh, so one way to think about this is this is uh, the energy comes from a variation of the, of a, um, so you have the JT action, which is going to be this minus gamma over two times the integral up to some time of the RH squared. And uh, if you vary this um, d by dt, so you vary the endpoint, uh, then this gives you minus the energy. Um, sorry, should I do this? So d by dt of ijt is minus the energy. So this is um, this is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And if you're not um, familiar with that, then you can go and uh, check the Wikipedia page, for example. So one way to see this is that the thing that appears in the path integral computing the energy is e to the minus i times capital I. So using this, the variation of, uh, and we expect this to compute something like a time evolution operator. So this is one way to, um, sorry, there's a plus there, explain the minus sign. Okay, so we've computed the energy. It's very simple. Um, and the temperature, we already know from last time that the temperature is related to the surface gravity, which is, again, extremely simple to compute. It's the uh, R derivative of the, or if this was a stationary metric, if there were no V dependence, it would just be given essentially by the radial derivative of this F at the horizon, as we saw last time. Um, so this gives us our thermodynamics. And in particular, we can use the first law. So, um, Yes is equal to uh, DE over uh, temperature. Excuse me. So here's our first law, and we can integrate this first law again straightforwardly to find uh, to find some thermodynamic entropy. The only ambiguity here is uh, is this S zero. So this here is appearing as an integration constant. You can't fix the zero of entropy from um, uh, from the first law alone. Um, now I've written it here as the same S zero that, uh, that appeared as the coefficient of the einstein hilbert action. At the moment, that's completely unjustified, but we'll see later that really um, that there's a good reason to expect S zero to be that, that, um, that given by that topological term. Okay, so we have this uh, entropy being linear in the temperature behavior. 
Um, fine. Uh, maybe I should note one thing to distinguish these from short shield black holes, asymptotically flat uh, black holes, for example, which is that um, this has nice thermodynamics. So in particular, it has a positive specific heat. And this is unlike black holes, uh, short shield black holes, for example, that, um, that actually, so here you can see that if we increase the temperature, that means larger horizon radius, we also increase the energy, which is the mass of the black hole. And short shield black holes have some slightly strange thermodynamics, which makes things more complicated. But here we have simple thermodynamics. Okay, um, so this is the most general metric. And even when we add matter and, uh, and so forth, this is still going to be the class of metrics we're considering. And all of this is going to remain true. But let's just orient ourselves by looking at the classical solutions of the theory at the moment without matter. Um, maybe I should pause for any questions before. Um, good. Okay. So, um, so we already imposed the equation of motion coming from the dilaton. That was this constraint that the metric is constant curvature. But we also have an equation of motion coming from the metric. This is, um, so again, you can uh, go away, go away and, and actually try and solve this again using these, this simple metric in these coordinates. You can plug it into Mathematica or, or spend a few minutes computing all the um, covariant derivatives and so forth. Uh, so if you look at the RR and RV components of this equation uh, and the boundary conditions, you'll find that the solution of the dilaton is extremely simple. So it's this. Uh, the dilaton is essentially identified with this radial coordinate r. Um, so straight away we can, because the dilaton is related to this radial coordinate r, we can write a new expression for the entropy over here. So it's again this f0 term plus 2 pi times the value of the dilaton at the horizon. And uh, this we'll see later is, is the analog of um, what uh, of area over 4G Newton in Einstein um, in Einstein's uh, in Einstein gravity? So this is this corresponds to to this fact over here is that when this comes from higher dimensions, the area in Planck units is given by this S zero plus the uh, dilaton. So, okay, you already see that. Um, now um, now we look at the VV component. So this is really a constraint equation. Uh, rather than a dynamical equation, uh, and this, um, and if you plug in your your solution for the dilaton into the VV component of this uh, of this equation, you'll find that um, you're forced to have a static metric. Uh, there's actually a nice um, there's a nice geometrical interpretation of this, which is that the um, one way of interpreting this equation is that. Uh, the level sets of the uh, of the dilaton, the sets on which it it's, has constant values, are the integral curves of a symmetry. So actually, there's a this tells you that there's psi a, which you can write as something like this. Uh, so one way of interpreting this equation is that this is a, a killing vector, a killing vector field. Uh, so it's a symmetry of the of the metric. So we need some symmetry, and that symmetry is is uh, time translation invariance. So there are only very special solutions here, without matter. Uh, and the only parameter that defines it is some constant value of of this radius of the horizon. So it's just a one parameter family of classical solutions to this theory. It's extremely simple. So here's a picture of uh, a Penrose diagram of of uh, what's um, covered by these coordinates. Uh, so the ingoing coordinates cover, so there's, there's some boundary here, boundary of ADS, where time runs all the way from, from minus infinity in the past to plus infinity in the future. This is a, an infinite value of this radial coordinate or an infinite value of, uh, of the dilaton. And uh, the ingoing time is, um, is identified with this uh, physical time over here. So if we wanted to know the time 
uh, the v coordinate are somewhere in the bulk, then you just have to trace this backwards along a null geodesic and see where it hits the boundary. So that's how these uh, ingoing coordinates are defined. So this coordinates cover the entirety of the uh, the future of the boundary like this. This is the region these coordinates cover, and this is the really the um, the physically interesting region. We we expect that uh, our black hole is formed from the collapse of some matter. So there's some matter over here, and uh, there's something going on over there. Okay. And you've got this event horizon that that's familiar. Okay. And we'll draw some more of this later. Okay. So there's another way of, um, before we move on to add matter and include the matter dynamics, let's um, see another way to write this same metric. So uh, the fact that we have constant negative curvature is actually completely determines the, the metric in two dimensions. So it means that our metric, uh, at least locally, the metric really has to be uh, anti dissipate space. It's just perhaps in some unfamiliar coordinates. So here's a, a set of coordinates for, for ADS, and I'm using these capital U's and capital V's now. And um, just to, this is maybe more familiar, this, these are, this is a light conversion of Poincaré coordinates. So this might be more familiar written plus D capital Z squared over Z squared. And um, <laughs> Yeah, that's better. And I introduce you to my rubber duck collection, who I explain my problems to. Fine. I was just going to comment on how Albert Einstein showed up for a brief moment. Um, OK, we can address questions about the ducks later. OK, so we've got this. Um, these. This is usual uh, Poincaré coordinates. Uh, so if you write um, u is t plus Z and V is T minus Z, then you end up with um, this metric uh, up to some factor. So, yeah, that's correct. Um, okay, so th this is, this is uh, usual, more familiar coordinates for, for ADS, but these coordinates are not going to be identified with asymptotic time in the way that we've that we've demanded. So we've we've defined this this little v coordinate uniquely by the fact that it matches with our uh, with T at the boundary. So uh, it means that we have to make some reparameterization. So there's some function f, uh, a, a diffeomorphism of the line, if you like, that um, that identifies these coordinates, uh, these Poincaré type coordinates, with the physical time. And once we've, um, so the boundary always is at big U equals big V, and it's also at little U equals little V. And um, so once we've done this, that gives us the change of coordinates that we need to make. So making that change of coordinates, you get the metric that looks like this. And um, we still don't quite have it in terms of the ingoing time we had before. We, we now have these double light going coordinates. And it maybe looks a little bit more complicated. Um, but it turns out that you can, uh, uh, so it might, it, it looks initially like it's going to be quite hard to, um, to, to put the metric in, um, in, oops in in this form but it turns out to be quite straightforward in the end uh, so don't worry too much about this expression we'll use it later but it turns out that you can write the the small r coordinate in terms of this reparameterization like this and once you do that you find that we recover the same metric we had before this ds squared is equal to minus r squared minus rh of v squared dv squared plus t dr dv. I'm going to try very hard to make my r's and my v's look different, um, but if at some point they start looking similar, then let me know and I'll try to make it Okay, so uh, it turns out that you get this metric back where the um, this horizon radius is given by the, um, the so-called Schwarzian derivative of this function f. So this is, is defined like this. Um, so, plugging this back into the on-shell action we found earlier, uh, we find that this 
which achieve tidal bloom action can be written as uh, in terms of the, the, the Schwartzian of this function f. Uh, so let's just um, go back to our diagram here. So um, it turns out that uh, now you can extend these coordinates to cover some larger region. I should get the ground. And, um, and these U coordinates uh, depends on exactly how you define them, but they might uh, cover a patch, perhaps something like this, where you can, uh, you can actually make different choices of using these. Um, but, uh, okay. but okay, so these, these, um, these capital U, or this, and U um, so in particular, actually this capital U coordinate is uh, is a coordinate that's um, that's going to be nice and smooth across the horizon. A light cone coordinate, so it'll be useful for us later because of the, what we emphasised to begin with. It's uh, this relationship between outgoing coordinates that are smooth at the horizon and outgoing coordinates at, that uh, correspond to asymptotic. Okay, um, so let's discuss uh, this. Let's check. There's nothing more I need to say. Um, yeah, so let's um, discuss a little bit more this this Schwartzian action and explain the other uh, give the other explanation for why this theory is very natural. Uh, so um, it appears uh, as a uh, a pseudo Goldstone boson. So we know that Goldstone bosons are associated with um, with uh, spontaneously broken global symmetries. So um, in this case, uh, it's a, a pseudo Goldstone boson because there's both spontaneous breaking and weak explicit breaking. Um, so we started off with a theory that had um, that had a diffeomorphism symmetry, uh, so a re time reparameterization symmetry, and that's actually this uh, einstein hilbert action. So the Einstein-Hilbert action here is um, because it's a topological term. It doesn't care whether you um, whether you change your time parameterization or uh, or how you. So it eventually comes down to to how you choose this boundary. It doesn't care at all. Uh, so that means that it has this diffeomorphism symmetry. The action, but the solutions to this Einstein uh, to the Einstein action uh, or the solutions to the to the theory with are, uh, are ADS, and ADS has a smaller symmetry. So the, this here are the symmetries of ADS, of ADS. So Einstein-Hilbert action, you have this, um, this spontaneous symmetry breaking by choosing an AD, a specific uh, ADS solution of this action. Um, so uh, in particular, we expect this model to be, um, to be parameterized by a coset. So it's the diffeomorphisms modded out by these um, by the SL2R, which are the symmetries of, um, of ADS. Um, but because we uh, because this Einstein Hilbert action was completely independent of the uh, of the um, of our diffeomorphism, uh, you don't really get a good theory here because your your action is zero. So you're just sort of integrating over this volume of this coset, which is in fact non-compact and it you don't get anything interesting. So uh, to get something interesting, you have to add uh, the smallest. So you take a, your variable to live in this coset and you add the, um, the lowest dimension um, term to the action that you can. And that turns out to be this, this Schwartzian action, which is associated to Jakeef tidal volume gravity. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with it, this is, um, uh, this is analogous to uh, in QCD where you have chiral symmetry breaking. Of, um, perhaps I'm going to get all the details right. You have um, is, uh, um, rotations on left and right moving quarks of NF flavors and, uh, and you get a Goldstone boson are, uh, are pions for this symmetry breaking 
but you also have explicit breaking, which is small, uh, and those come from pion mass, uh, from quark masses. So if you set the quark masses to zero, and indeed they're small compared to the, the strong scale, so, so you can, it's reasonable to neglect them, then you get an exact Goldstone boson, which is analogous to this. Um, but if you include the quark masses, then you explicitly break this symmetry and you add a, a term analogous to the Schwarzian that breaks this, the, the symmetry of the cosine. So if you're familiar with it, that might be a helpful um, way to uh, orient yourself. Any questions about that? This is, we're not really going to use this in the rest, uh, but it's, uh, oh, one more very important comment here is that this is the reason why, why we should expect the Schwarzian action to show up elsewhere. Um, that it's really uh, a thing that, that, is, uh, uh, that is characteristic of this sort of symmetry breaking. And, um, and a prominent example here is the, the SYK model and some of its cousins. Uh, where again you have this sort of symmetry breaking and that's the underlying reason why the Schwarzian, the same Schwarzian action shows up both in JT gravity and in this uh, XYK model if you're familiar with it. Okay, any questions about that part? Uh, is there any other um, symmetry breaking patterns such that you can have a larger symmetry and then SL2R? Um, I'm, I'm sure there is, I'm okay. I, well, um, uh, yeah, so certainly you can do something trivially by extending the symmetry here and just having a product. Um, mm -hmm. it would only be interesting if this, so the, this SL2R is embedded in the morphism in a particular way. So you'd need to have, uh, some sort of. Uh, the SL2R would need to be, uh, for it to be different, would need to be embedded in some different group in a different way. I don't know. I'm, they're, they're probably possible. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is sort of, this is quite natural because it's it's almost the closest you can get to conformal invariance in uh, full conformal invariance for a one dimensional system. You just um, um, go. Uh, can you explain again uh, why this uh, deferred morphism breaking happens? Uh, the action uh, action of the uh, geometry should be deferred morphism invariant, right? Yeah. So here we're talking about the diffeomorphisms on the boundary. So indeed, oh, oh, it okay. has the gauge diffeomorphism symmetry in the bulk, but there's this physical uh, clock, and and the thing that breaks that symmetry in the end. Is, is our choice of boundary conditions that there we're tying. Uh, if we changed our notion of boundary time, then we couldn't have both of these things still be true. Mm -hmm. So this is it's this choice that's breaking our. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Um, good. So uh, let's um, let's use this language. We talked about the static solutions in uh, in these ingoing coordinates before. So let's um, let's talk about them in these uh, in these new coordinates in terms of reparameterization. Uh, and uh, there's a simple answer for the static metric, which is that it's uh, given by uh, some exponential up to an SL2R transformation. Uh, you may have also seen an SL2R transformation of this is the potential of RH times P over two. Uh, this is um, this is a nice possibility because it puts the metric in a manifest of static form. But um, but we'll we'll make use of this. Um, and the last few comments is that this SL two R you should sort of check it's obeyed by all your equations as a nice um, nice consistency check. And for example, uh, it sort of it looks completely magical to begin with. But if you plug in um, if you change f to a f plus b over c f plus d, and you plug it into here, you'll find that this uh, your definition of r is totally unchanged. It's invariant, so that's a nice consistency change. Uh, and this Schwarzian action uh, is uh, also SL two invariant. Good. Okay, so that's. Um, 
uh, let's now add matter. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to make some general comments on the, the philosophy that apply not just to uh, JT gravity, but more generally is a, a nice way of calculating things in this um, so-called semi-classical approach to gravity. So we have some, um, some action, which is the gravitational part of the action with JT, and then some matter part of the action. And then uh, counter terms will, will comment on occasion. Um, the, um, if we really want to do the full path integral, even for JT gravity, this is quite hard. Perhaps you could um, you could solve it, but um, but but so far it seems quite difficult to to solve it in, in to really compute things with uh, So what we're going to do, um, uh, what, what your natural approach now is to say that we want to look at some classical limit. So a classical limit means we look for stationary points of this full action. But that's um, that's no good because it doesn't capture some very important physics. So in particular, we want there's some um, quantum corrections that come from the CFT that are actually very important. So uh, black hole evaporation is um, is not captured if you just look at subtle points and then and then look at small corrections in a little bit because a black uh, an evaporating black hole is after a long amount of time is not just a small correction to a static black hole. It changes its mass a lot. So we need to take that into account. So the way we do it is this halfway house, this so-called semi-classical approach, is that we treat the matter in a fully quantum way. So we really do the full path integral for the matter, um, but we use saddle points then for the geometry. So to explain that, we um, we start off with this, um, whatever conformal field theory we have, whatever matter theory we have, which depends on some matter field X and also the background metric. and uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll comment here that we've, we've made a particular choice that we, we're deciding that our, um, our CFT is coupling to this metric G and uh, not some combination of this metric and the dilaton. So this is, uh, again, a natural choice from the higher dimensional perspective, but yeah. Okay, so we really do this path integral with whatever boundary conditions are relevant for the problem we're studying, and that defines this effective action. Uh, so in that, we've got rid of the matter field, so it really only depends on the geometry we can do, on the, the gravitational degrees of freedom. And then we um, look for extrema um, by varying the metric and varying the dilaton, in this case of the JT action plus the, this quantum effective action. So this is going to be, this effective action is potentially uh, well, it's certainly going to be non-local, um, and uh, particularly for a CFT, you'd expect it to be local on a scale um, of the on on distance scales much larger than the mass of the theory. But uh, but here we've, we're talking about a massless theory, so it's certainly going to be non-local. Um, but nonetheless, at least uh, formally, we can do this. Anyway. So now um, the thing that gets modified when we look for saddle points is we have these classical equations of motion. So now they're sourced by a quantum stress tensor, this expectation value of TAV. So this is the definition of the expectation value of TAV is through the variation of this quantum effective action with respect to uh, with respect to the background metric. So this is really just the definition of the, the stress tensor expectation value. And this is in, in whatever state with perhaps other operator insertions elsewhere, depending on what you're trying. Um, just a minor comment that's not so important. It's it's convenient here to choose to add a finite counter term up here for a cosmological constant um, to cancel. So we talked about the fact that trace p is proportional to the curvature. Um, so here, because we have constant curvature, it tells us that the trace of the CFT, um, uh, the trace of the the CFT energy momentum tensor has this contribution from the curvature. But it's convenient just to get rid of that, and you can do that by adding this finite term. And this is really just the redefinition of the um, parameters of the theory. This is convenient. So it means that this guy is now traceless. Okay. okay, so this is some general comments on, on the matter and the equations we're going to have to solve to look at subtle points. Uh, let's talk now about the uh, about the boundary conditions we're going to use. For those equations. Um, so 
if we just had our matter uh, propagating just in in ADS, so we um, this is this is supposed to be a, the picture of ADS we had before, then our black hole isn't going to evaporate because uh, the Hawking radiation, if our boundary conditions are a unitary, is going to bounce off the boundary and reflect back into the black hole, and we're not going to get evaporation. Um, yeah, another way of saying it is that unitary boundary conditions uh, satisfy the, the boundary that TUU equals TBB. So the ingoing flux matches the outgoing flux. Um, so you might see examples of this when uh, Sudeshi is talking about boundary control. Um, good. So instead, we're going to uh, have uh, our matter be able to move into some external system. And here, our external system is going to be a uh, this um, flat fixed background, a half of Minkowski space. So it's we're going to uh, use our u and v coordinates here, um, but here we this is going to be a region where where the ingoing coordinate is larger than the outgoing coordinate. So a coordinate in here, you determine the uh, ingoing coordinate by by following a null geodesic to the boundary. So this tells you what v is, and the outgoing coordinate, you follow a, an outgoing null geodesic to the boundary. So this tells you where u is. So you can see that v is bigger than u in this flat region. And um, that is going to be joined to our anti consider space, except now we, this is this um, way we have this dynamical Jakeev type of one gravity. And this is this region where u is bigger than v. So of course, the, the little u, little v coordinates only cover this patch, um, but we could always change coordinates to, to go to some other region. Um, and again, using these same small u, small v coordinates, we have this, um, this metric in the dynamical JT region. And uh, and then we just let the fields um, propagate freely across this boundary. And this is simple for a conformal field theory because uh, this we can always, uh, this metric here is minus omega squared du db for some conformal factor omega existing. Um, so we can always just consider the fields, uh, we can solve the theory with the fields on this flat background, just minus du db. And then we, we take into account what this conformal transformation does. So again, you don't need to know much about CFT. Um, but if you compute any correlation functions in a conformal field theory with a metric that's, that's uh, rescaled like this, so this is a metric omega squared times g, then that's related to the original and the, the correlation function computed in the metric without the rescaling uh, up to these factors here. I should just say here that um, this is this for primary operators. Oh, in fact, we've see, already seen an example of an operator that's not primary, namely the stress tensor. And there we had those, um, these, uh, yesterday we had these inhomogeneous terms from the stress tensor. So they obey some slightly different things. But, um, okay. Uh, the only thing I'd say here is that you should be a little bit uh, careful with states because uh, it might be that your state looks simple, some vacuum state or something over here. Um, but then this correlation function over here is perhaps not a vacuum state in this metric. So, um, so we'll try to be careful with that. Um, okay, uh, so when our black hole, when we want to study our, our um, black hole, we're interested really in, uh, we're going to wait for a long time, allow any transient effects to settle down, and then, uh, and then study the, um, study the theory in that background. Uh, so at late time, we're going to be studying states that look like the vacuum state, but in this particular metric. So why this metric? First of all, uh, we've already commented that, um, that we need to, if we want to have uh, our uh, state to be smooth at the horizon, so there's nothing in particular going on here, there's no particular reason why there should, we should be having any uh, singularities and so forth here. Um, so um, the state should, at least at very late times, look like the vacuum in this capital E coordinate. Yeah. This is just it's another example of, of a, having a smooth horizon. And we're going to use the small V coordinate here 
because this uh, vacuum in this small V coordinate uh, is related to the fact that we don't want to have any stuff coming in from infinity. So we want to let the black hole evaporate. Okay. So it's um, it's often it's a sort of nice crutch in um, two-dimensional conformal field theories to think about um, the uh, separately things that move to the left and things that move to the right. So um, we're here, we have things that move to the right um, are, are in some vacuum state uh, that's smooth at the horizon. So it looks like the vacuum over here and things, the left moving things are in the vacuum over here. Um, yeah, you should bear in mind that that's not literally true for apart from for say free theory, for example, but um, that really left and right movies talk to each other, but this is a convenient way to motivate this. Okay. Good. Any questions about these um, these boundary conditions? Yeah. Yes, Henry. Um, yeah. I was wondering, is it possible by choosing another boundary condition to let the graviton also propagate into the bus? Um, so actually, in this theory, we don't have a dynamic gravity. Uh, so this is. We saw one avatar of this when we looked at the solutions to pure gravity. Um, let's find it where it is. Um, our solution to pure gravity, we all, always had, uh, were all, all static metrics. They didn't have any dynamics. And uh, this wouldn't be true in Einstein gravity, say, because there, you could always add propagating gravitons that would be new solutions, uh, add gravitational waves. Um, so there's not actually a gravity. Um, you can, another way of thinking about that is just counting degrees of freedom. This is, a, a, um, so the, the number of degrees of freedom in a metric uh, is, um, well, I won't go through it, here, but roughly speaking, gravity in two dimensions has minus one degrees of freedom. And you add this dilaton, which gives you one more degree of freedom that makes the theory, um, sensible and interesting, but you're left with zero propagating degrees of freedom. So you don't have Oh, yes. So, so maybe uh, I should ask in this way, though. Is it possible to choose uh, the Neumann boundary condition also for the metric? Um, for the metric, uh, choosing a Neumann boundary condition is, um, yeah. So this is something that was studied recently. Um, I can. Uh, yeah, so there was there's a recent reference that I can uh, that I can find. Perhaps I haven't checked the um, the Slack channel yet, uh, but if you like the reference for that paper, then let me know in the Slack channel and I'll and I'll pass it on. Um, where they study very systematically some different types of boundary conditions. Um, but uh, yeah, that's. I think, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just say this is, um, uh, it's made it like a, a strange model, but this is, um, this is a reasonable model for, uh, for what would go on higher dimensions with an asymptotically flat black hole. You can think of this, uh, this as, a, as some far away flat region, say for a rising Nordstrom four dimensional black hole. And then the JT gravity region is the, is the near horizon region where you're, close to the black hole. Um, and usually there's a complicated geometry that glues them together, but um, this is a, a sort of simple and, and crude model for, uh, for how you glue together the asymptotically flat piece and the um, ADS piece. So, uh, so it's a nice way to think about this uh, is, is a studying asymptotically flat, ball, the flat black hole in a particular uh, sort of simplified model. I think, thank you. Okay. Um, so let's um, let's see what this. If we're studying this particular state, we want to uh, examine the this, this sort of state, and we want to examine what the dynamics looks like. So we want to be uh, solving this dilaton equation. We should uh, ask what the stress tensor looks like in, in this particular sort of state. Uh, so we're going to have. Uh, TUU, this capital U in 
u and v coordinates is going to be zero, or at least at late times, it's going to become exponentially small. So as a simple model for that, we're going to just, just set this flux to be zero. So this is telling us that the, um, again, it's the same fact that we're using over and over again, that the horizon is smooth, which means the state near the horizon looks like the vacuum after, uh, after um, some, some amount of time. Uh, okay, we're using this again. So translating that to the, um, these our, our, um, our ingoing coordinates, we find this TRR is zero expectation value. Uh, and we also know that um, TVV, um, oh, sorry, this is TRR is zero. So this is just a simple change of coordinates. And um, TRV is, um, is essentially the trace of the stress tensor. And this is zero by, by tracelessness. So this is why it was useful by this counter term earlier. Um, if you don't add the counter term, it doesn't change things very much, but it just makes things slightly simpler. Um, so that means we only need to study this uh, TVV. And as before, we can relate this TVV to, um, we have our picture looks like this. So we have our flat region. And then we have our JT region, and we're going to, uh, you, you can use the conservation equation to define uh, ad infinity TVV is this FV of V. So we have this flux from infinity, but then when you cross into the uh, ADS region, uh, this, um, this picks up this anomaly piece that we can use just there. So let's see where that was. So we computed this yesterday, and it comes from, from an equation that looks something like this. That's what we calculated yesterday. Um, but, um, okay, so we can we can write our, our flux like this, and um, it turns out that now the the we can solve the Dillon equation of motion quite generally on this uh, for this this sort of source. Uh, so the Dillon solution doesn't actually change. It's again related in this simple way to the radial coordinate. Um, but then the thing that does change is this, uh, this VV component. So here we found that the metric was static, but the source adds some source on the right hand side. So it allows the, the horizon radius to vary as, you, as you'd expect. And one way to write the equation of motion is uh, it's just like this. So it tells you that the, um, the rate of change of the energy is just the rate at which energy is flowing into the system. So we've got no energy flowing out by, um, by this assumption, or, uh, yeah, um, but we do have this energy flowing in. Um, yeah, I should say that this is, having no energy flowing out is, uh, is um, slightly um, dependent on the, this sort of choice of frame. And you should the, you should remember that no energy flowing out, so zero stress tensor in this in the ADS two region, uh, because of this anomaly corresponds to thermal entropy, uh, you know this thermal density of states, this Hawking radiation in the flat region. Okay, um, so this is just saying that there's the the rate of change of the energy. So this was given, this energy was given by either the uh, the square of the horizon radius before. Or alternatively, it's given by the uh, it's proportional to the, sh the Schwarzian of this free time transition. Okay, um, so um, so with our metric looking like this, now now this kappa, the surface gravity, depends on time. It's given by the the kappa is just equal to the horizon radius, which we can also relate to the uh, to the energy. So you get an equation like this. Um, so it tells us that the, the energy is, first of all, it, it increases if you have stuff come in from infinity, um, but it decreases because of Hawking radiation. So this is the effect of Hawking radiation. Good. Um, and this is um, really the uh, sort of black body law, Stefan Boltzmann law in, uh, in one dimension, um, one spatial dimension. So if we don't have any flux from infinity, then we can just solve this, uh, and it, the, we find that the energy decays exponentially from some initial spike. So, um, 
parameter is with this k. And this we should think of as being a, a small parameter. So gamma here you can uh, is um, is something that you can think of as controlling the uh, the semi-classical approximation. So you can think of gamma as being as being large um, in the units of uh, of energy and time and so forth that we're interested in studying. Okay, so the energy just decays exponentially. Uh, and now we can, um, and now we can summarize what we found about our reference. Um, so yeah, so we had this metric, which was in, uh, which we wrote in ingoing coordinates like this, and we have our data set. So we're always going to be studying uh, solutions that look like this. It looks nice and simple, and the um, and this horizon radius, which is um, so the square of the horizon radius of the, is the energy, uh, it, it decays exponentially. So this factor of two is uh, so it's decaying exponentially. But we should think of the time scale of the decay as being very, very slow. Uh, and we also uh, said that we wanted the matter state. We want to study this um, black hole with some non-singular matter state of the horizon. So that was um, necessary to get this result, and we'll, we'll also use it later. Um, and then finally, we can express it in terms of this reparameterization variable. And uh, it's given by, uh, roughly speaking, it's given by an exponential. So this is uh, the result we had for a static black hole. Um, but because the evaporation is slow, uh, this, is, this is actually true over, over sort of relatively long time periods that are shorter than uh, k inverse. So that means we can start with a black hole, maybe that's quite large. We can uh, let that black hole evaporate, but then if we're just studying um, uh, correlation functions and so forth with time differences that are small compared to one over k, uh, then we can use this. Although the this this you can think that one way to think about this is that this prefactor a is something that varies slowly, and R h is something that varies very slowly as well. But you can, uh, off, yeah, we can always use an approximation like this. Um, there's uh, and I just mentioned that this um, this is something that is a, a a much better approximation to the exact solution, and this is really true over very very long periods of time, and, and works until the black hole is extremely small. But, um, and okay, so an exercise here is to check that um, that this equation here star label this one dagger. Uh, that star looks um, like this other equation dagger over time differences delta t much less than one over t. So maybe you can take t is equal to t naught plus uh, delta t, where this t naught can be very large, if you like, it can be of order one over k, but this delta t is smaller, and check that this um, that it looks like it's the um, Good. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the the summary of what of the evaporating black hole. Uh, uh, okay. Any questions here? Uh, yes, Henry. So this uh, this page uh, or those uh, pictures or these equations of this uh, black holes. I, I was wondering if you take the dilaton goes to zero, let's say trivial dilaton limit. Does this picture still hold? Um, so we're always part of our boundary conditions are that the the dilaton is is blowing up asymptotically. Um, and in fact, if the dilaton becomes small, uh, maybe you could think of that as gamma being a, a small parameter, then um, then quantum fluctuations become uh, become very important. So the um, so we don't really have we can't we aren't really justified in talking about um, using this semi-classical approximation. So let's just find let's find this action. You'll see here that I haven't included. Um, and usually here you have a denominator as a factor of g newton. 
and small g newton corresponds to the classical limit with a large action or large variations of the action. Here, the thing that's controlling that is really this um, the diloton. And if the diloton is large, uh, then you might expect to have a classical. Uh, and that and that is true um, at high temperature. So this is um, this holds true as long as the um, uh, let's see what the is. Um, as long as check this um, which parameter has to be large yeah well as long as the temperature is large in units of gamma. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is everything we're going to, to have to use for this, these black holes. And um, I just want to re-emphasize that these are, are telling us something, um, um, something important and physical is that, so first of all, this area of the horizon, this is, this is analogous to the area of the horizon in higher dimensional black holes. Uh, the, the black hole is going to slowly evolve as it evaporates. There's a non-singular state of the horizon, and this is encoding this exponential divergence of, of outgoing geodesics near the horizon. So these are all facts that um, that are really telling us something that's more generic and applies to higher dimensional black holes. Good. It's time at last to talk about entropy and make use of uh, of the the things at the very start of yesterday. So first of all, we need to tell you about how to compute um, entropy in, in formal field theories, uh, and in particular in, in some curved background. With a metric, which is, you can write in general, like omega squared of some. So perhaps this is a flat metric, and this is some arbitrary function. So this is, you can write an arbitrary curve metric. And this is basically the only thing we're going to need to know about entropy in, in conformal field theory. Uh, and that's how it behaves under this rescaling of the metric. And it has this simple, uh, simple formula. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, the metric in the, oh, sorry, the entropy in, in the rescale metric of the matter in some interval in any state is the entropy computed in the unscale metric plus this sort of anomaly piece that comes, or plus this, this transformation piece that comes from, um, uh, that comes from the bar transformation. So this is, you can think of this as, um, as coming from this. So I think uh, in Tadashi's lectures, this uh, talks about how to compute CFT entropies by correlation functions of some twist operators, which are a particular example of um, primary operators. And the entropy, roughly speaking, is like a logarithm of a of a uh, of a correlation function, or it's the limit of a logarithm of a correlation function. So uh, that's why you get this this fact, this additive factors of log omega. Another way of thinking about this is that um, is that the entropy is is divergent, and it depends on the uh, the way you cut it off, and uh, and if you change your local notion of length of the endpoints, then you're changing um, how you regulate the divergence. And that's why you get these log omega. So that's all we need to know. Um, so um, here's our, a picture of our, our black hole again. And what we'd like to study is the entropy of some Hawking radiation. So I'm not going to really worry about this um, early time. So once again, we're going to be sort of not worried too much about, about this region of the black hole uh, of early times. We're really interested in studying what happens here at late times, which is really independent of, of, what's, uh, of what's gone on earlier. And what we're interested in is what happens as we, as we evolve the endpoint of this interval up to some new interval. We capture some more radiation which escape the black hole. Uh, and we want to see how the entropy of this radiation has, has changed. 
And we should emphasize here that this we're talking about um, is, is a fine grained entropy or uh, in the, it's a von Neumann entropy. So we're not, this is not a calculation at the moment of, a, of some coarse grained entropy, it's really a fine grained entropy. We should, I'll just contrast that with earlier, we made this calculation using the first law with static black holes. This was a, a coarse grained entropy. It was using these thermodynamic variables, but here we're computing um, fine grained entropy. So uh, that means we're computing uh, the entropy of some state uh, in, in this um, flat metric. So our metric is just the, the, the usual flat metric written in light cone coordinates. Um, but uh, now we're going to use the important fact that our, metri our, our state looks simple, not, um, um, so it looks like the vacuum near um, capital U equals zero. So uh, we're using this ingoing, uh, excuse me, we're using this outgoing Friscal coordinate uh, to describe the state this um, at late times. So u equals zero corresponds to very small, capital U corresponds to very large values of small u. So late time corresponds to that um, vacuum state near the horizon. So uh, it's actually simpler to use this um, to describe the, the physics in, in this metric and then use this VAR transformation that comes from this uh, reparameterization. And once again, we'll emphasize that this reparameterization is something physical. It's telling us about the uh, about the the um, the divergence, the exponential divergence of outgoing physics. So, using our our, our very general formula for vial transformation, we know that the von Neumann entropy, as it as we move uh, this endpoint, we can compute it from the von Neumann entropy of the a state that's um, uh, as calculated in this flat metric. And then we have to add this, um, this extra piece that comes from the vial front. And uh, the important thing only here is that, um, is that as, far as, uh, as far as this metric is concerned, um, capital U equals zero, nothing special to be happening. So it should look like the vacuum. There shouldn't be any uh, any uh, rapid changes in the entropy. This is just going to approach some constant as we take capital U to zero, uh, which means taking small u to be large. Um, and um, uh, and then so then we have this piece, and this we can compute uh, using this formula we had before of the this exponential. Uh, so because we don't really want to worry about what happened early on, um, it's convenient to just ask how this varies as a function of time. So we just differentiate this with respect, with respect to u, and we're putting the end of our boundary interval at close to this, um, close to the, uh, this line along which we couple the two systems. So we're going to have effectively u is approximately b approximately t. So this is this is the end of our interval. Um, so if you differentiate this with respect to u or with respect to t, um, you'll discover uh, just differentiating the, the rate of change of the entropy. So von Neumann entropy is increasing at this rate. And it's the rate just using this exponential form. Using this exponential form, you could also use this form if you prefer, um, but you get the same answer to uh, up to some negligible corrections, yeah. you're producing entropy at the at the rate you expected from uh, from the earlier calculations, saying we had a thermal state, uh, or that the um, that the asymptotic observer sees this sees a flux of thermal radiation, where where the Hawking radiate where the temperature is given by um, the the this horizon radius, um, but. This is potentially problematic. In fact, it is problematic because we're here computing a fine-grained entropy. This would be perfect if we were computing a coarse-grained entropy, uh, some sort of thermodynamic entropy. Uh, so here, an actual entropy, a sort of entropy to use is 
because the, the temperature of the Hawking radiation at early times is going to be larger than the temperature at late times. So you need to have uh, some sort of hydrodynamic notion of entropy, for example. It would be fine if it was a thermal entropy, but it's not. It's a, a fine grained entropy, a bottom entropy. Um, we'll just note, and this you um, can check the formulas from earlier and go and, and calculate uh, this Bekenstein Hawking entropy that we computed, which is given by the value of the um, dilaton of the event horizon, or it's just given in terms of the, the energy of the black hole at any particular time. Um, so this is a thermodynamic entropy, is a very important minus sign. So the black hole is evaporating, it's losing energy, it's reducing in size, which means that its entropy, thermal entropy is decreasing. Um, but it's important here to compare the rate here and the rate. Here. So uh, this is larger by a factor of two. And this is, um, this is because evaporation is, uh, is actually irreversible. Uh, and it produces thermal entropy. And uh, it's um, if you've done this exercise from way back near the beginning of yesterday, you may be more motivated to do this exercise if I tell you it's about something that's more exciting than a um, uh, than just a box of photons. It's actually telling you about black holes. If you, if you compute this in D equals one, then you actually find precisely the same results and you'll, you'll find this factor of two difference between the thermal entropy of the radiation and the thermal entropy of light. Um, but it's, uh, but we'll see this, the, this ratio between, uh, this rate of thermal entropy production uh, prop up elsewhere. Okay. Um, so before we move on to um, uh, interpretations, I'll ask if there are any questions. I'll just comment first that if you if you um, consult the literature, you can find um, slightly more concrete examples of this calculation. Where uh, so I haven't really defined the full state of the system for you. I haven't um, told you precisely what intervals we're calculating, and I haven't calculated things exactly. In this model, you can really calculate all these things exactly. Um, but I wanted to emphasize something slightly different, which is, which is how general this result is and, and how it follows from just these rather simple set of examples uh, of um, the properties, in particular this smooth horizon and, um, and this sort of exponential divergence. Really, whatever you start with, whatever's going on over here, you'll get the same, um, the same um, production of the moment entropy at later times. Good. So hopefully that was all clear, and we can move on to interpret this. Uh, so this is our result plotted on a, on a curve. So we're uh, the the black curve is this entropy of the radiation that we plotted. It's increasing with uh, some rate that's exponentially decreasing uh, and it's going to saturate at some value and the red curve is plotting this um, thermal entropy where I've subtracted this it's zero extremal entropy there's this um, this is um, these differ by a factor of two um, in four-dimensional black holes there's some slightly different factor it's uh, it needs computing numerically um, but okay um, so the important thing here is that um, is that this entropy of radiation is just increasing and it shows no sign, sign of stopping. And in particular, um, one thing I could do is decide to throw more stuff into the black hole. So if at this time I, I decide to um, throw more some, let's say, um, pure state, um, so let's see, throw some pure state matter into the black hole. So I'm not, um, uh, I'm not throwing the radiation back in or something, um, but I'm, I'm throwing some pure state matter black in, back into the black hole, then that'll sort of recharge it and it can increase again. And I can throw something in again and I can recharge it and it, it, it can increase again. So 
That means I can make this radiation uh, entropy, this von Neumann entropy of radiation, as large as I like. And I can then, I, once I've thrown matter in for the last time, I can let it settle down. And the black hole here can be as small as I like. It can be uh, of the lowest energy I like. So that means that we fix this. Um, if you choose some fixed size of black hole or fixed Bekenstein Hawking entropy, thermal entropy, um, we can generate arbitrarily large um, entropy of radiation in, the, in this reservoir system. Uh, so that means we can create arbitrarily large entanglements, it would seem, between the black hole and the radiation system uh, at some fixed energy. And this is the quantitative, quantitative version of the, uh, of the black hole information problem. Uh, so um, this is the problem because, because we had this bound before. So if once you add... Um, and maybe I should have another red curve all the way up here. So S naught might be very, very large. In fact, we usually take it to be something that's parametrically large, but you do this enough times, this is going to be the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And once we're up here, then we violated this bound that we discussed at the very beginning. Uh, we, if we want Bekenstein Hawking entropy to be interpreted as, a, as some kind of thermal entropy, something that is uh, giving us a coarse grained count of the number of, uh, um, of internal states of the black hole, then this becomes a problem. So there are a few ways we can resolve this. Um, one, th one possibility is that, uh, is that we've overinterpreted um, the bekenstein hawking entropy, that it's not uh, really a thermal entropy in the quantum statistical sense that we described with the, uh, above. Um, the alternative, and the only, uh, seemingly the only alternative is that uh, ac the actual thermal entropy is infinite because we can make the, en the, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation as big as we like for a fixed black hole. Uh, we can create arbitrarily much entanglement with the black hole. That means it must have infinitely many internal states. Uh, and this, is, a, this is, is one particular problem, which in fact doesn't apply in two dimensions, but um, but the basic problem is that you can imagine scattering gravitons or photons. So this is a black hole. And you can uh, think of having an effective description of the black hole where you, where you uh, declare ignorance of what happens inside some, uh, inside some radius and just model it as some number of, of particles. Um, and we know that we can scatter gravitons off it or scatter photons off it if it's charged, and they couple in a completely universal way it's defined by the mass or charge of the black hole. So we know how to compute uh, sort of Feynman diagrams like this in our effective field theory. But in any relativistic theory, you can, uh, you can apply crossing symmetry. So that means that you can have diagrams like this, for example. And now if time is running upwards, this is describing um, a, uh, a pair production event. Where you so one example of this is to have charged black holes, and you put them in uh, in a background electric field, and this is uh, the process. This describes the process of Schwinger pair production that black holes get pulled out of the out of the vacuum. So it's um, um, but so this you can for any particular internal state of the black hole you can compute the rate of this, which is. Uh, rather general, it applies to any relativistic effective field theory. Um, and, uh, and there's some rate, which is going to be extremely small for any fixed internal state. But the total rate of production will be multiplied by the number of internal states. And the number of internal states is as bad as it could be, it's infinite. So if you have something extremely small multiplied by something infinite, then you expect this, uh, this to describe uh, uh, complete instability of the vacuum. You turn on a very, very small electric field, and suddenly you have uh, you have infinitely many black holes in your hands. This is um, I probably don't need to tell you that this uh, disagrees with experiment. Um, okay. Um, so the other poss another possibility is that either we miss something. So there's using the existing physics. There's some um, there's something wrong with our calculation, uh, or perhaps we really need some new physics that this model is needed. 
Um, I might just comment um, to begin with that in JT gravity, uh, you don't have this pair production problem um, because in in one spatial dimension, um, the, you can't. Uh, you, there's no sort of transverse space for a black hole, so you can't actually describe two black holes in an otherwise flat space. Um, and actually, JT, this is a perfectly sensible problem. So this is um, so in JT, this is what you get. You can formally take S zero to infinity. And S0 didn't really play any role in the dynamics. So, um, so this is one way to think about that. OK, so there's either we missed something or there's some new physics that, that, um, that has to happen. And this is surprising because we, it, there didn't seem to be anything wrong with the physics we, we were using. This space time has low curvatures everywhere that was involved in our calculation. Uh, in the chat, someone was asking about the singularity. Um, so um, this, you should can think of there actually being a singularity up here. So this is what you would get if you, um, uh, if this was a, a, a rise in Nordstrom black hole, the Penrose diagram looks like this, an ADS rise in Nordstrom black hole, uh, where the diloton goes down to, to minus infinity. And this is, um, this you would interpret as a singularity if you use this, um, if you use this sort of dimensional reduction, because it's where the, if the diloton becomes very negative, then it means the area of the, the transverse area is becoming very small or, or in fact negative. So, so this region you should interpret as a singularity. And perhaps you should interpret this region as a singularity as well, uh, because um, um, essentially the opposite of, of a Hawking production process. A Hawking production, we use the fact that there was a smooth horizon here to tell us about the stress tensor over here. The converse of that tells us that if we have no matter incoming over here, then the stress tensor is going to be singular here. Uh, so the reason this, this is a Cauchy horizon uh, where we can't, um, um, there's no unique prediction for, for general relativity because we need to have some Initial conditions of the singularity, the boundary conditions of the singularity. So there's certainly a singularity here, and and more physically, really, there's really a singularity here. So you hit some. Yeah. Yeah. Another way of saying it is, if you physically fall into the black hole, then if a butterfly flaps its wings over here, it sends in some very small perturbations that, at this Cauchy horizon, they become uh, infinitely blue shifted. So the butterfly flapping its wings will uh, will kill you in a shower of energy. Okay, so, so that was just to say that, okay, there's problems with singularities up here somewhere, but we didn't use any of that. Our physics was, uh, we, all the physics we used was just to say, there's a smooth horizon, it's a weakly curved black hole, there's nothing obviously wrong with our model. Uh, okay. uh, and there's a last possibility that, um, that we'll talk about uh, probably in the last lecture, uh, which is this um, super selection sector in Bayesian University. Okay, um, so the next uh, topic is to try to try to resolve this, uh, and we'll start to get on to some of the exciting uh, new developments uh, in the last five minutes today, and probably the first board of an hour um, next week tomorrow. Okay, uh, so let's let's ask how we, we compute entropy. Um, I should see if there are any questions first of all before I talk about calculation of entropy in gravitational systems. Yeah. Um, so what we want to do is compute, compute the entropy. We're going to start with a with a simple example, which is to compute the the canonical entropy, this particular sort of thermal entropy. And this will give us, um, so before we computed the bekenstein hawking entropy using the first law, using what we knew about the temperature and energy, here we're going to see, get the same formula in, in what looks like a very different way. Um, so um, what we'll do to calculate this is first of all, compute the free energy, which is essentially the logarithm of the partition function, which is the trace of the, uh, this uh, e to the minus beta h. So as is familiar, this is this looks like a time evolution operator, except with imaginary time. So you should think of this as being a time evolution in imaginary time, 
And then the trace tells us to identify the initial point and the end point. So time becomes uh, this circle. So we have this periodicity. So um, in ordinary quantum systems, we would just put the, um, put the theory on this Euclidean circle. Uh, but in gravity, uh, the natural, um, because the metric is dynamical, we can't uh, impose that we have some periodic metric everywhere. Uh, some specific fixed metric. So, uh, instead, the, um, the usual boundary conditions would be to fix the uh, fix what the metric and other fields look like asymptotically. So maybe this is this is sort of true more generally. Is that um, maybe I'll this is worth commenting on. Worth taking a minute or so. Um, gravity, you have a dynamical metric. Um, in a general theory, you so for example, if you're computing a scattering problem in, in Minkowski space, you have a fixed Minkowski background, but you uh, what you define as boundary conditions for your path integral is the state at scry minus at infinity, so the in state, and you define the out state. So you fix the fields asymptotically, and then you integrate, uh, and then you integrate over fields in the interior. So this is this is fixed. And then in, in the interior, you, you integrate. Um, so in gravity, it's natural to just generalize this. This is, the, so this is always the rules I'm going to be using to fix the metric asymptotically, but integrate uh, elsewhere. So that just means that I include these fields that I integrate over uh, to be in the interior to be include the metric. So in this example of a, of a thermal, uh, of the computing the partition function, we fix the metric to have this, uh, to have this closed circle asymptotically and, um, and the solution typically fills it in. So this is what a Euclidean black hole looks like. And it has this uh, time translation symmetry uh, and there's in particular a fixed point of this time translation symmetry. Would be important. Okay, so we're going to use this sort of semi-classical method to compute it. Um, so the partition function is going to have two pieces. Uh, it's going to have a gravitational piece of the action, uh, and it's going to have this matter effective action. Uh, so that means that if we uh, just take the logarithm, uh, then we write it in terms of the free energy. Um, we have the uh, this on-shell gravitational effective action. Per, um, per Euclidean time. So this is um, this actually because you have the time translation invariance. This is basically the Lagrangian. It's the, the on-shell Lagrangian. It's the um, the action per unit time. And then you have this other term, which is the free energy of the matter. Uh, so that this is just you're you're doing the usual uh, thing with the matter, the free energy of the matter, but uh, on on a on this sort of uh, this half space. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we want to compute the gravitational action. So what we're going to do is vary the periodicity. And um, I'll, yeah, this is probably the last thing to talk about. Uh, uh, so let's start off by talking about this classical piece, this on-shell action per unit Euclidean time. And we're going to vary it with respect to the boundary condition. But there's a trick here that we can use, which is um, what, we, what we're really doing is changing the action and keeping it on shell. But we're differentiating. We only need to look at the first order variation of the action. And because it's a solution, the original metric was a solution of the equations of motion. Uh, that means that to first order, it doesn't matter what we do in the bulk. We can, we, as long as we vary the boundary metric in the correct way, any variation in the bulk uh, will give us zero because it's a subtle point. Um, and um, one particular choice is that we can just change the period while keeping the metric uh, and fields of fields exactly the same as a function of time. But when we do that, we get this conical defect of the, of the, uh, of the middle. Um, so, um, so the important thing there is that when we vary with respect to beta, we're not changing the fields anywhere. 
Um, so the, the action per unit time is actually constant, independent of beta. So we don't get any contribution from, uh, from far away. Uh, we only get a contribution from the cone. This is the same reason, by the way, that in non-gravitational systems, uh, you don't usually get a classical contribution to the entropy. This is why it's, uh, if you have a local action, then, um, then this argument involving the on-shell action and uh, tells you that you're not going to get any entropy, classical entropy, if you have, uh, if you have a um, time translation symmetry. Uh, but here, something different happens that only depends on the geometry of the event. And you can calculate this in Einstein gravity or in JT gravity, and uh, the contribution you get to the entropy is the area and Planck units or this analog in JT gravity. Um, and we won't do that. Uh, and the last, um, the last couple of minutes, um, yeah, let's just we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, now we look at the quantum piece, but this is just computing the, the free energy of the matter, derivative of the free energy of the matter. So this is just um, the, uh, the entropy of the matter state, but on this surface. So it's the same sort of argument. You, you have this, this conical space with this beta periodicity. So you can think about just doing the matter um, path integral on, on a family of backgrounds with different conical defects and taking the limit as, as that conical defect goes away and you get the center. Um, so if you add these two terms up, you get what's called the generalized entropy. So that's the area and Planck units plus the entropy of matter. Um, yeah, I could finish here or I can take three minutes to make an extra comment that fits in here. Bartek, are you? You're muted, Bartek. Uh, absolutely, take the three minutes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so we should note here now that um, that we're computing the entropy of some matter on this uh, on this um, space that has a finite boundary. And if we're talking about quantum field theory, uh, as we already discussed the entropy on, uh, has some divergence. So for example, in 2D, we already sort of mentioned this, uh, the entropy of the matter um, has this divergence for each endpoint. So epsilon here is, is, a, is some um, ultraviolet cutoff scale um, of the theory. So it's not, not the same epsilon we have in the boundary conditions, it's some UV cutoff for the matter theory. Uh, but so that looks bad. It looks like our generalized entropy is infinite, uh, the resolution to this is that the area also has this um, has is is really infinite, and this is where we briefly mentioned the counter terms earlier. Uh, this is where the counter terms uh, play a role. So, for example, if you just compute the effective action of some theory, for example, a conformal theory, or or um, applies back to a massive theory as well, um, then then you get uh, divergences. Like this, so we don't often talk about divergences in conformal field theory because we usually, because uh, there's there's a nice finite way to talk about it where we've already implicitly subtracted them. But of course, the divergences are always there. If you had a theory on a lattice stimulating the Ising model, then you would need to have a lattice cutoff, and you'd need to subtract divergences, um, or uh, or you need to tune things to get to the good. Um, so typically. The divergences uh, look like this. So this is in some, um, this is actually uh, computed using heat kernel regulator. So there's some regulator, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's, first of all, a counter term that's the cosmological constant. So here you have to fine tune to get rid of this. That's a cosmological constant problem. Um, that doesn't really play a role um, because it doesn't contribute to the entropy for us. The, uh, there's no area in, a, in the tip of a cone. So it doesn't matter for us. The more important term is this second term. There's a logarithmic divergence. Um, and uh, this logarithmic divergence is proportional to this sort of Einstein-Hilbert type term. Uh, so because this cone has delta function curvature at the tip, uh, what you'll find is that if you do these, these calculations with this counter term, with, or the, uh, with a counter term that's, um, that 
that cancels this, um, you'll find an extra uh, C over six log epsilon in this uh, uh, contributing this area. So there's this extra constant divergent piece that depends on. The, and again, this is some UV cutoff. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that if you add these two things up, so you take the matter piece plus this counter term from the area that we use to subtract divergences in our matter, uh, that they go away, they cancel. So this here will cancel with this. And you end up with a finite quantity. And I mean, from the beginning, it's not surprising we had a finite quantity because we originally defined things on this completely smooth metric. There's nothing in particular happening here. And only later we started calculating things, dividing it up by using this sort of three uh, geometry. Um, but um, so it had to be, it had to work out. Uh, but the upshot here is that only really this generalized entropy and not the separate area term and entropy term is, is well defined because of the finite thing that's invariant under our, our, our G scale. And so, for example, you might have some matter in your, some very heavy matter in your theory that will contribute to matter entropy. Um, but then you might use an effective theory at a lower scale where you integrate out your heavy matter. And that, um, that gives you uh, integrating out that matter will renormalize the gravitational action. And then um, this matter entropy gets compensated for, this matter entropy in the high, high energy theory gets compensated by um, area in the low energy theory. But the combination uh, is this generalized entropy is finite. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to generalize this uh, and use this to talk about um, gravitational entropies, not just this um, fine grained entropy, uh, sorry, not just this entropy of, um, uh, of the, canonic, the canonical entropy, this thermal entropy, but talk about um, things that are more like von Neumann entropies. Um, and that'll take us on to the new developments. Um, good. And I uh, should have pointed out. I should have pointed out earlier that this uh, this is the the formula that we had uh, before, but now we actually have a justification of why we should use this guy it comes from this Euclidean part. Good. So with that, I'll um, invite any questions. We'll get the page going.